right, welcome, welcome. This is going to be a how to play for the Phantom Epoch, a game by Tyson Abernethy and by doTERRA Games. So this is going to be a video that is actually going to be using conjunction with a tutorial mission as you go throughout it. This will go through each point as, as it is encountered in the tutorial mission. Therefore, the goal is so that you could watch these clips instead of going to the rule book and reading. You could just come watch these videos. That will be much quicker and easier so you're not doing as much reading. So please follow along with this video with the tutorial and we'll get you going in Phantom Epoch. So the first thing we're going to do for the mission setup is we're going to get mission book A, mission book B, place the mission book on the left, and we're going to open up to where we need to be. The very first thing you do when you open up to a mission is you're going to read the introduction part of it. It's going to give you kind of a brief backstory of this mission. Now just to note, down the road you're going to have more options for missions. This introduction may be read before that mission is chosen. However, right now the tutorial mission, this is what we got. So we're going to read this and then we're going to go on to the next step. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up anything on the board that it tells us to. So this one here, it's got a picture of an orb. So I'll take an orb and I'll place the active side up versus the inactive side. So we're going to take that active side and place it right there on the board. Now, one thing to note real quick is there's two type of orbs in this game. There's campaign orbs and mission orbs. The difference there is campaign orbs will actually have a number next to this. And that number will take you to the extras book where you will read that number. Now it's called a campaign orb because it can only be activated once per campaign. Therefore, if you play replay any scenario, that campaign orb will not be there if it has already been activated. So we play this. The next one is this mission orb. So we'll play this here. That mission orb does not have a number. That means that's going to be per the mission. It's going to tell us what happens there. So it doesn't matter however, however many times we play this scenario, this orb will always be placed in that area. And the mission book will actually tell us what happens with that orb rather than having to go to an exterior book. The next thing you need to grab just to have off to the side are your adversary description cards. Nothing is spawned here, but have those off to the side ready to grab. The next thing you want to grab and just have off to the side for now are going to be the species deck and the class deck. Have them off to the side just ready. The next thing for a setup is actually an event deck. However, for the tutorial mission, we are not going to worry about these. So we'll talk about them later when they come into play. Now we're going to grab a character deck and we're going to get 10 cards. Now to start off for this tutorial mission, each character already has only 10 in their deck. So you can grab the 10 and you're good. For future references, you will start to add to this deck, which you'll be able to switch up. You can only take 10 into this mission. So once you get more cards, you'll have to decide which ones you want to put in and out. So that at this point, now you've picked the 10 cards that you want to take into that mission. Then you're going to grab your character board and you're going to find in the attachments all the ones that have an X on it. If it has an X, that means that it's a starting equipment attachment or anything. The only thing anyone starts with is actually just the one attachment. And you know which attachment they start with because you can match the symbol. So that symbol matches that one. So this one is the warrior's attachment card that he starts out with. Collect that all together for this scenario. Later on at this time, you could switch around everything else. However, right now we're just gonna worry about that attachment to put on there. And that's how we are gonna start. As well, you're gonna choose a species. You got male, female, human, male, female, Grolic, male, female, slink, each with their own different abilities, health, and action points available for each turn. And the last thing for board setup is you're gonna place any of the heroes on any one of these spaces that have that little symbol there. These are the places that you can start. You could choose either one you want to start no matter where you wanna be. And last but not least, before you start the mission, you gotta read the mission start. It will go through, you'll give you some idea of the mission, it'll give you a little story, and it'll give you a mission vent, and then this little gold tab there is you'll read everything until you get to one of those gold tabs. Then, as it says, you'll stop reading until one door, one character has destroyed the door adjacent to them. 
So once that actually happens, then you actually come back here to the mission book and read on. However, to start the mission, you read up until that golden banner and then you go into gameplay. All right, the next thing that we need to know is there are things as objects. And there's two different objects. There's indestructible objects and destructible objects. We're first gonna go through destructible objects. We're gonna be show, shown with these dark blue borders here. Then you're gonna have indestructible objects with these light blue borders around them. Now the difference kind of in the name, destructible. So the one with dark blue borders, they can be a target of attack. And when they're hit, doesn't matter how much damage, but when they're hit, you will place a damage token on that thing. Then when it is attacked and hit again, it will turn into difficult terrain. Now difficult terrain is characterized by a yellow border around that hexagon. So when there's difficult terrain, it'll actually take two movement points to move in to that space and then continue to moving out of it just fine. But it does take two extra or an extra movement, therefore two movement points to move into that hex with the difficult terrain with the yellow border around the area. The destructible objects just or the indestructible objects, just as it sounds, cannot be destroyed. Therefore, if it gets hit by an attack, there's no damage, nothing happens because it's indestructible. However, it cannot be the target of an attack and you cannot land on that space, which makes sense. Neither one of them can you actually land on that space, but line of sight can be drawn through either object, whether destructible or indestructible, line of sight can be drawn through any object. The next thing we're gonna look at are doors. Now, doors, unless otherwise stated in the mission book, doors are always unlocked. The way to open them is you move your character onto that hex with the door, the door opens up, you do whatever the mission book says when that door opens up. Now, for this tutorial mission, in the mission book, it actually states the door is locked, you will have to break it down. So that way we know that the doors are not unlocked. They are locked and to unlock them is actually just breaking them down. There's no key to these doors. So that is, a, if this nothing like that is stated, those doors will be unlocked. However, in this scenario, the doors are locked, so they you will have to break them down. So we're gonna go through what a round consists of. The very first thing you do for each round is you're gonna roll this decision die. Now, the point of this decision die is it's gonna help you make decisions for the enemies when there's two choices that are evenly just as good for them. This is how you choose. As you can see, each one has a color, a big letter, and a small letter. So you go ahead and roll it. We got light blue, S and W. So what the very first thing you do is color, meaning if anybody has that color of base, that's who they target, who they're going after, what the effect goes after. If that does not solve the decision, you're gonna go with the most south character or object if that still does not solve that question, you will then go with a small number, which is West. And then by that point, you will have a certain decision of who you're affecting, what's it's affecting, anything to resolve it, you will have it after that. So you've got North, South, East, and West on all of these. So each time they may target a different person, depending on where they're at, depending on if it's the same, if there's even choices for the enemies. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to draw an event card. However, like I said, we're not going to worry about the actual event card right now because for this tutorial mission, this mission event is always active. So we won't actually draw that card during the second part, second part of the round. However, we will have to make sure that this mission event is in effect throughout every round in this tutorial mission. Now, each character is going to go through their hand of 10 cards and choose as many as they want to play. However, the stipulation is, is according to your species, your max AP that you could play for this human is 10. So, when he is choosing his cards, the 
initiative point or the action point here on each card, for all of them that he plays, the sum of them can only add up to 10 at max. Now, the other thing is that whatever the AP is, also is going to, going to be his initiative for the round. So you will have to kind of, if you want to do a lot, you might go slower, but if you want to do a little, you'll go faster. So you go through and you could pick up one, up to as many as you can, as long as you're underneath that AP value. One thing to note here, as well as when you've got multiple players here, is you're not allowed to actually discuss the exact things that you're going to do on your turn. However, you can say general ideas like, hey, I'm going to go attack that slink as fast as I can, or my goal is I'm going to go straight to that orb to try to activate it. That's my goal, right? So you can kind of say what your goals are, but you can't really say my initiative is this and I'm going to do this, this, and this, right? The other thing you can do instead of actually playing cards is you could decide to rest. Um, we'll talk about resting a little bit later, but that is where you decide right now. Instead of choosing cards, you would choose to rest. Now that both people have chosen on their own, at the same time, all players will reveal the cards that they chose to play. And they will look at the initiatives and they will see who goes first for the heroes. We've got the healer at eight, the warrior at nine. Therefore, between the heroes, the healer is going to go first, then the warrior is going to go. Once again, just a thing to note, at this time you would reveal a species and a class action card for each adversary. However, there are none on the board, so we won't worry about that right now. Now you look at see who goes first. The one that goes first is with the least amount of numbers. R one goes first, 20 goes last, right? So then you look at and you take the turns in that order. Once everyone is done with their turn, at the end of the turn, each card will get discarded as soon as they play those cards. And at the end of the round, after everyone's gone, any effects that have end of round effects will be applied at that time. And after that, you will begin a new round with rolling that decision die again. Real quick, we're going to go through some key concepts here. The first thing I want to talk about are some different type of attacks. So there's three different types of attacks that were shown here. The first one is just a normal attack. This one's got a plus one, but there's no range. He's a warrior character, so there's no range or anything. That is what we call melee, meaning you have to be adjacent to the target to attack with that one. The next is a ranged card. Now, there's two ways that it could be ranged. One, on the card itself, will say ranged, as this one does, meaning he get attacked two spaces away. Or, on the character board, it will tell you what that character's range is. Like the ranger, she, they have a little bit more of a range, automatically even if the attack card doesn't say anything but so they're ranged and uh, they do the target does have to be within line of sight we'll kind of go through that here in just a second but that is ranged and the last one is multi-target as this one says attack target three that means you can th shoot three separate things and when you have separate targets you will actually roll the attack die separately for each individual character or object that you are targeting. So we're gonna go through the attack flow real quick here. All right, so this is how we start. We're playing this card. It's a melee, right? Because we need to break open this door. So we're going to uh, attack it. The first thing we do is we're declaring the target. Because we really can't move anything right there, we're declaring this door as the target. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna roll the attack die. However, there are two separate attack die that you could roll here. You have the basic attack die and the blitz attack die. The main difference is the basic attack die has one critical, one fumble, which is your critical fail, right? Then your blitz die actually has two crits here. However, it has three fumble symbols on it. So it increases your chance of critting, but it also increases your chance of fumbling. Now, as a hero, you may choose whichever die you want to roll every, every single attack. However, for the adversaries, they will always roll the basic die unless otherwise stated on a card or an action card or anything. 
Now, so we're gonna choose to roll the basic die because it doesn't matter the damage we do, we just need a hit. So we're gonna roll that. We roll a two and it's a plus one. So the next thing that we do, once we roll that, we're gonna add any values. So we have the plus one. Then we are going to calculate guard value if we were attacking an enemy. So we'll go through that later. However, at this point, there is no guard value for the door. So all we have to do is apply damage to it. And when we attack a door for the first time, it doesn't matter whether you do one damage or 10 damage, you will damage that object, or in this case, the door. In the case that this was an actual enemy or an adversary, any conditions that were with the attack would then be applied after all the damage is taken. And one last thing about the attack and the attack die is rolling. If you roll a fumble, that means you fumbled your weapon and you will not be able to attack for the rest of that turn. The rest of your attacks are nullified. Your fumble is a complete miss for the rest of the turn. So it's kind of a pretty big hit. Then the critical, the critical the three, you're going to use it like a normal three, just like any other side. You're going to use it a three for the value. However, the critical does a couple things. One, the critical is going to go through all of the enemy's guard value. Whether it's one, whether it's ten, it will go through the entire guard value. Second is you get to activate a critical ability. Now, each character has a different critical ability at the top of their board. His critical ability is he gains a barrier and vengeful, or his starting attachment is critical ability inflict stun. Now, like that, if you start, if you have multiple critical abilities, you get to choose one of them that you want to activate each time you roll that critical. So you roll the critical, you go through all guard, you get to activate your ability and do some good damage there. All right, so I have this set up just to kind of demonstrate here. We're gonna talk about range, right? This has a range of four, so we'll go one, two, three, four, right? We're gonna count as many hexes, even if we're here, we've still got one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. Still the same amount of distance there. Now, we're gonna talk about line of sight. Now, line of sight, we're gonna draw a straight line from any corner of one hex to any corner of the other hex that we're targeting. That way, that means we could go from this corner to this corner. There's a straight line without intersecting any object or anything else. That means we have a clear line of sight, meaning we're not going through anything. Now I wanna kinda of correct myself here. I said any, the only thing that we can't do is we can't do one corner to the exact same corner of the other one. So we can't go with this northeast corner to this north northeast corner. However, we can go to the southwest corner, sorry, west, not east, northwest corner to northwest corner, but we can go to the northwest corner to the north southwest corner, draw that straight line. That way, he, they actually, he does have a clear line of sight to go through that. Now, you can choose any of them. Meaning if I wanted to, I could choose this corner to go to this corner so I actually go through that. However, that would not be smart because it's an indestructible object when I do anything. But you do have that option. You could choose. Snares might change up. You might want to do that actually sometimes. It kind of doesn't sound right, but it actually could be. So I wanted to point that out. Meaning line of sight can be drawn, as I said before, through any object. The only thing line of sight cannot be drawn through are any walls, which we'll kind of go, get into that a little bit later when we get more enemies, but line of sight can be drawn through objects. The last thing about ranged attacks is if we do end up going through an object, what we have to do is we have to actually roll the accuracy dice. Now, what the accuracy dice is going to do is it's got three different sides on here. It's got three sides with the success symbol. It's got two sides with the block symbol 
and one side with a complete miss. For every object you shoot through, not the target, just any object or character you shoot through, you will have to roll this accuracy dice. Now, what you'll do, so let's say we're attacking through this object, just for scenario reasons, or teaching reasons. Roll, roll. So, I hit that block symbol. That means my range attack actually hit this destructible object. Therefore, it did not actually reach its target. Now, if this was a destructible object, it would get a token because it got hit. However, this is not a destructible object, so nothing would happen there because it got blocked. Now, if I would have rolled a success, that means I successfully shot it past that object and hit the enemy. Or, and last one, is we could get that miss. Now, if we roll that miss, it's that whole attack over, it doesn't hit anything, it completely misses everything. All right, so one last thing I wanna talk about here with the accuracy dice is if you are adjacent to an object or any other figure on the board, you do not have to roll an accuracy dice for that object that you are adjacent to. So with this character here, and you're adjacent to this object, it's got that dark blue border, because he's adjacent to this, to shoot this archer, he does not need to roll this accuracy dice because he's already adjacent to this object. Meaning thematically, he is just gonna reach around the corner and kind of be able to shoot past him that way rather than have to try to shoot through that object. So you do not have to roll the accuracy dice for the object that or figure that you are adjacent to while trying to figure for hitting or missing. All right, now we're gonna go through the actual character's turn and what it looks like. So the very first step of your turn is if you have any detrimental effects, anything on your board that should be discarded, you could remove any of those temporary effects if, the, if you have any of the temporary ones. The next thing you're gonna do is apply any new effects. If you have some effect that gives damage at the beginning of your turn, it happens now. Meaning, if anything removes the tokens, like any effect or anything, they will be removed before they cause any damage at the start of your turn. So that's kind of an important step there that they, anything is removed before any new effects are applied or any damage is applied. All right, one more thing I want to point out here is we have both temporary and persistent effects that can come from our hand. The first one is this temporary symbol. When we play a temporary card, instead of it going into our discard pile, it is going to go into the temporary slot. This card is active as soon as we play it, and then it stays active until the beginning of our next turn. At the beginning of the next turn, we'll take it from our temporary slot and put it into our discard. The second type is the persistent there. When you play a persistent card, once again, instead of putting it into your discard pile, you will put it into the persistent slot, and as soon as you play it, you will have this effect active. This effect stays active until you choose to discard this card during your turn. As soon as you decide to discard it, that ability is no longer active and you can go about. But so this stays on there until you choose during your turn to discard that persistent ability. Now, after all of the conditions are met with, now you'll go through and start playing your cards as we had talked about. All right, now we're gonna talk about resting. So we've just used those two cards to break out of there. Now, for the resting action, the first thing that we do is your initiative is gonna be counted as one, meaning you're gonna go very, very first. And the second thing is you cannot play any action cards. You say, I'm not playing any action cards, you put it down, your initiative is gonna be one. So when it is your turn, you are gonna recover all cards in your discard pile back to your hand. Then you're gonna remove any detrimental, any of those persistent detrimental, effect, detrimental effects. They will now be discarded during the rest. And then you could change out any attachments or equipment during this rest. However, you cannot change out any items. The two items that you bring into the mission are the only two items that you will be able to use during the mission. However, with these equipments and the attachments, 
you can bring more on the side and during the rest mission you could switch out any of the equipments and any of the attachments and you can recharge the items and equipments as needed that ends your whole turn right there quick note if you had any items you can use items during your rest turn however we don't have anything this time so that completes our rest round and we have all of our cards back to our hand now the next thing i want to go over is converting action cards so as we know every action card already has a description of what's going to happen however you can convert each action card to one of two things either movement so no matter what it says here you can convert it to movement according to its ap value so that means you could use this card to guard one and attack or you can convert it for three movement you can convert as many cards as you want so he's got an ap value of max of 10 that means if he wants to convert all 10 of his ap to movement he can move 10 that round the second thing however none of the card effects will happen it'll just be the movement or the second thing he could do any single card here can be converted to an attack action so even this guard plus three ap value of three you can convert it to an attack action of plus zero however the only stipulation with this is that you cannot or if you do convert a card to an attack action, you cannot complete any other attack during that turn. That means an attack, another conversion attack, also means no cards that have an attack action on them. So you have to kind of use it wisely of converting only at least one card to an attack action or as many as you want to move actions. So now we're going to talk about some actions that can be taken during the turn through the cards. The first one is the attack, as we just talked about. That is one thing that you could do on the cards. Another thing you could do during your turn is activate orbs, which is the next goal. And how you do that is you just end your turn adjacent to that orb. Now, as soon as your turn ends is when you flip that orb over and you activate it and you do whatever either the mission book says or if it's a campaign one that has a number you'll go to there and resolve that campaign orb as soon as your turn ends before the next turn starts for the next character. Now, the second thing we're going to talk about is the move action. So the move action in this game is pretty similar to most games, um, right? You can't move through objects, destructible or indestructible cannot be moved through. You cannot move through any enemies. Um, you have to walk around the enemies. However, you can move through any of your allies so i can move through him however i have to walk around the enemy or move around the enemy also you cannot if there is an orb there you cannot move through any orbs this is an indestructible space so it kind of doesn't work but if for whatever reason there's an orb there you cannot move through that orb either now the next thing is we're going to talk about a leap leap is very similar to movement but it's just kind of like a jump meaning right you're leaping through so you can leap through objects and indestructible objects and orbs even you can move through them as long as you're not ending landing on them also if there are any as we talked about difficult terrain on the map Leaping through those only takes one movement to enter instead of the two. Also with leap, is you can leap through enemies. However, once again, you cannot land on an object. You, have to, you can move through it, but you cannot land on an object. You can't land on orbs. You can't land in other non-empty spaces. And leap actions cannot be joined together. Also with the movement, is you can actually combine all your movement together into one main big movement as long as that movement is not interrupted at any point if that movement is interrupted at any point then at whatever point you are at the rest of the movement is discarded for the rest of the turn two other things real quick that i want to cover you won't get to it yet but another thing you could do is actually teleport with certain movements or certain cards that tell you to teleport 
and it is just as much what it sounds. You take a character off and you place it wherever you're supposed to teleport to. The second thing is to heal. There are healing actions in this game, and when you play a card to heal, you will be able to heal yourself up to no more than your max HP. So one last thing about healing is you've got these two spaces on here for bandages. Now what these bandages are is anytime you receive a healing action, either from someone else or yourself, you will receive a bandage token. Then if you heal again, you will receive a second bandage token. Now, when all your bandage areas are full, you cannot be healed anymore. Now there are other ways that the game might put bandages on you, but so that way and with healing, you will get these bandages. When you have, when your player board is full of bandages, you cannot heal anymore. There are some special abilities that can remove bandages. However, they are not super common, so it's not a good deal to bank on those, but that is something out there. But so that is what bandages are for. So the next thing we're gonna do is spawn a new adversary. I wanted to note here, as you can see, we actually have it all gridded out for us here. So that means we could have an I6 for this base, or I guess an I5 for this base right here, H6, a J6, right? So that's kind of how it can tell us what we need to do. So as we see with the Slink Archer, two to four players means whether we have two, two, up two, three, or four characters, we're gonna place this enemy, and we're gonna place this enemy on L4, on that grid pattern that we just went through. So we come back to the board, we have L4, we slide over, and that is where we spawn. Also a really cool thing is you got the health tracker right here on the base itself. So now that we have it placed on the board, the next thing we're gonna do is grab its description card. It gives us the HP value, the guard value, how much it attacks for, and then the range that it has, and then also the critical ability it has if it rolls a critical. So we have set the HP to five. The next thing we're gonna grab is the species action deck. We're gonna grab that and place that off to the side as well. And then we will grab the class action cards and set those off to the side because a enemy that is spawned in the middle of a round will not draw any action cards. If any action cards are already drawn for that type and species and class, they will still will not activate no matter what. Also to note that there are different color of bases here. These color of bases are going to be important for the activation of each enemy here. All right, so once you have your cards picked out, you will then flip over a species and a class order card. Now for this tutorial mission, you are told to grab tactical retreat and retreating fire. So go to go over these cards real quick, this here is the AP cost, which will go towards their initiative value. And then according to the color of base they have, will go according to what is on the card. So we have chosen the light blue for this archer. That means he will perform fire arrows on his turn. And as, as you can see, hit that AP cost is four. So you add those together, therefore his initiative will be seven. Now, at the beginning of their turn, they will first apply any new effects that I have on them. So if there's any conditions that say at the beginning of their turn, this is when they'll happen at the very first when it becomes their turn, then they will select their primary target for the card's action. They will always play the species card first and then the class card. So it'll always be in that order. Also one thing to note, is guard, so you're gonna take your attack value for whatever it is, and you're gonna minus the guard from that. So let's say I roll the three, and so I have three damage coming in. This is a little different with that negative one guard value. It means that they are vulnerable. So it will be three minus a negative one. Therefore it would be a three plus one. So you'd actually do four damage 
to that character. However, if they had a guard of one, then it would be three minus one. Or if they had just a one value, there would be three minus one, so it would only do two damage to them. And then also, each enemy also has a critical ability they're written at the bottom that if they roll ability they will do that critical ability as well also going through any guard value that the hero has so now we're going to go over how to pick that primary target for the enemy so we want i want to just clarify the primary target and what that means right the primary target is going to be the enemy and or object which is the focus of the movement and our attack now, this primary target can be altered by mission rules. If the mission says that the primary target is always this character or whatnot, that will always take precedence. Now, if for whatever reason there are no enemies on the field or all, all the heroes are in visible, then the heroes will not move at all. However, in this scenario, we won't get that deep, but just wanted to point that out here. So now we're going to go through the criteria of how to find the enemy's primary target. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to look for the closest target. Now, what the closest target means is that it's going to be the fewest movement points to get to an enemy. So for this scenario here, we've got one, two to him and one, two, three to that guy. Therefore, he is going to be the primary target. However, now you look at what you have to go through. Since he actually has to go through that object first, that means that target is going to become this for a melee attack because he cannot attack his target. So therefore he will attack the closest object. Now, priority wise, he won't. You will always, they will always attack a damaged object before a non-damaged damaged object. If there's no damage, it'd be any non-damaged object. Now, if that was still undecided of which one was best, then he will always take the safest route to avoid any hazard terrain. Then, if that's still the same, then you will always go to that decision dice to figure out who the target of the attack will be. Now that all said, in this scenario here, we actually have a archer who has a range of five. That means he can shoot through this object. So he will still keep him as his target because he is the closest enemy and he is within line of sight. Now, the second thing that the enemy is going to do after he draws that line of sight. Now to determine line of sight for them is there are, they will always try to go through the least amount of objects as they can. So as you can see, he doesn't really have a choice, but he does have a choice of going through a destructible object or, or an indestructible object or a destructible object. And he will choose to go through a destructible object, therefore having the chance to damage this so he could actually walk through. So that will be how he draws his line of sight and determining who will be the primary target. All right, so now we're gonna go over the adversary action cards themselves. So first off, if their card says that they will target an ally, they will first choose to target themselves. They are considered their own ally, but if they are not able to target themselves, then they will target the nearest ally, meaning one of their allies. And then they will always try to move as far away as they can from their target per their range, even if it puts them outside of the benefits of helping out an ally or something, meaning their, their hatred for the enemies is greater than um, the care for themselves or their allies. They will try to get as far away as they can from the target. Now, the card themselves, they have an AP cost there. So this has an AP cost of three. Then you've got the action right there. That there is a round symbol, meaning as soon as this card is drawn, this effect is in effect for the entire round. Then we go to here, and here, like as stated before, depending on their base color, will depend on their action. And here's the AP cost there. 
So you will just add species card with the base color for the class card, and that will be each individual adversary's action or initiative value. Now they can also convert their cards to movement. They cannot convert their cards to attacks, but they can convert their cards to movement. Now they will convert just the same with the heroes cards. They will convert it to whatever the AP cost is. However, they will not ever convert one to movement that has a round on it because if you convert one to movement, you disregard anything there and you just move the AP cost. Therefore, if there's a round effect, they will not convert this to movement. So even though this movement might put them in range for an attack, they won't do it because they will not want to get rid of that round value. Now, let's say they move or they don't move there and uh, so they're not in range to this do this attack they will convert this attack to that AP cost there and they will move five instead of doing that attack so they will convert either one to a movement as long as there's not a round value also if there is a move movement already on the card itself they will also not convert it even if the ap cost might be more than the movement they will still not convert it because there's already a move and or leap action on the card itself the next action they can perform is both movement and leaps just as the hero the rules are the same there if they are a ranged character they will always try to move as far away to their max range as they can so in this scenario he can't really move farther away. However, if we were in this scenario here, so he's a two away, he's got a range of five. If he has the movement, he will try to get that five movement away there. He will try to get away as far as he can from his enemy and be at that max range as much as possible. Now what this is gonna bring in, this is gonna bring in a lot of options of where he can go, right? Meaning both of these spots here are within the exact same range. So there's a few things where we kind of figure out which one he goes to. First, if it's an empty space, they're both empty spaces, cool. The next, if they have any other enemies within range, they will probably towards that spot. Meaning this is a little bit of a small map to really demonstrate this. But let's say if here he was in range of both of them, but here he was only in range of one of them, then he would choose this space to be in range of both of them. Even though he's only attacking one, he will prioritize the space where he's in range of as many enemies as he can. Enemies to him, meaning the good guys, right? The next is a few amount of, few amount of movement points it takes to get to there, right? So if he's here, both of these are within the same range, but this is one less movement point, so he would choose that one. However, if he was here, right, so they're both the same movement point to move to there, then that is when we go to the decision die and get to choose with that. Also, there's some hazard terrain, and the only time they move through anything hazardous or damaging to them is if it is the only option to move and if it is the only way to get to the max range from the target. Meaning, even they will do anything they can to get to that max range, even if it means hurting themselves. If that's the only option to get to that max range, they will hurt themselves to distance themselves as much as they can from their enemy. The next few things I wanna talk about just real quickly here. Uh, enemies have a thing that they call retreat, meaning it's just the same thing as movement, but it's usually the last thing they do on their turn, which is exactly what it sounds like. So even if he's at max range here, if he has retreat, he will continue to move away further than his range. He will try to just distance himself as much as he can from that primary target. The next thing is teleport. As we talked about before, same thing. You take that character off the board, place it wherever he is to be teleported to. And last thing is healing. Enemies can be healed or adversaries can be healed. However, they do not have bandages like the heroes do. So they can be healed as many times as they can depending on what their action cards say. So they do not have bandages and that's how healing will always go used for them. However, it's just the same. They cannot go above max HP unless otherwise stated on any cards. So next thing we're gonna talk about are the conditions. 
So we have a lot of tokens here that represent a different type of condition that can be placed upon the heroes and adversaries. Now for the heroes, if they get a condition, you will just play it on your character's board. They have these really cool stands here with extra slots in the front and back. So you can slot them there. You could put good in the front, bad in the back, right? However you want to organize them or in the front so you can see everything that they have. That way when you move them, you're not dragging everything across the board with you, but they're right there in front so you can remember which conditions they have on them. Now, I'm not gonna go through what each condition actually does. That's pretty self-explanatory in the book it goes through. One thing that I wanna note though, that in the book, if it does not say when to take the token off, that means you have to rest to take it off. If it just says, you know, vulnerable, minus two to your guard, and that's all it says. That means that it's going to be on there. It's going to be permanent until you rest. And then you can take those off. Some of them like burning will tell you to turn it off, to take it off at the next turn or anything. So be aware of that. If it doesn't say when to take it off, you take it off whenever you rest. So defeating an adversary, pretty self-explanatory when their health goes all the way down to zero, that character dies now as soon as that character dies you will place a nova cell which is the currency of the game on a place where they were just at now real quick to pick that up is the same thing to activate an orb as long as you land or end your turn adjacent to or on a hex with a nova cell you will collect that nova cell at the end of your turn now, for a character defeat or a hero defeat, if the character goes down to zero without that 10 HP thing, if that goes all the way down to zero, that hero or character is defeated and will be placed back on to the Phantom Epoch. He gets backed up to go, go get recovered there. You'll remove him from the map. You'll remove any conditions. You'll give him all of his HP back. You'll discover or discard or recover discarded items and you're gonna recover until the next mission so you're out for the round basically or not for the round for the scenario for the mission until the mission is either lost or successful and if you are defeated any Nova cells that you acquired during the mission you still get to keep so even if you die later at the end of the mission you still get to keep any of those Nova cells that were collected during that mission. Now what happens if you both die, the mission is a failure. What goes on? So if you fail to complete the mission objective, um, that is not optional. There are some optional mission objectives. So if the non optional objective is not completed, or if all the characters have been be, be defeated, then the mission is a failure. And upon the failure, all characters are going to be evacuated back up into the Phantom Epoch for recovery. Any of the campaign orbs, right, ones with numbers, so not this one, ones with numbers, campaign orbs or campaign treasures are kept upon failure. So if you get anything through those campaign orbs or treasures, you get to keep those. If they are mission ones, then it kind of depends on what the mission says. Usually you don't get to keep those. However, there's no other straight up negative effect unless otherwise stated. And you can attempt any mission any amount of times that you want. All right, congratulations. You succeeded the mission, All right? Congratulations. Now, what do you do? First thing I want to point out here is the rewards and unlocks box here. Anything on the reward side, you will immediately gain. Anything on the unlocks, you will note down what you have unlocked on your character and campaign sheets. Once a mission is successful, you will clean up the board, take anything off. All of the hero's HP is fully restored. You get to remove all your conditions. You start afresh. You may go to your character sheet here and mark down whichever mission you have completed with that character.
you will come to your campaign sheet, mark down which mission you have finished, and you will also mark down which ones are now available. So this green side for each one are for which ones are available, and the red ones are which ones are completed. Now, with the completed, there's two marks you can make. You can make a check mark if every single objective was completed, including the optional ones. You will put a check mark. However, if you completed the mission, the non-optional mission objective, but you did not complete the optional mission objective, you will put an X in that column, noting to yourself that you could go back to get that non-optional objective. Usually it's kind of beneficial for you. The last thing you're gonna do after you complete a mission is you're gonna grab the attachment deck according to the difficulty of the mission that you just completed, which this one has a difficulty rating of one. So you grab the one deck and you will shuffle the entire deck and you will flip over four attachments there. Um, you'll have them revealed, but as you reveal them, each character gets to pick one attachment for free, take it to there. One thing that I want to, a couple things I want to note here is there's a couple things here. If it has that space with a one, that is where you put a Nova cell that you have collected to charge that ability. Now, to perform that ability, you will have to spend that Nova cell to do whatever it says. The second thing that I want to note with these is some of them don't have a picture and some of them do. If there's no picture right here, it means anyone can have it. If there is a picture here, it means only that person with that on their board may have it. So that one's obviously the Ranger. So if that symbol is not on their attachments on their board, they cannot attach that attachment to them. So you pick which, any ones that you want. Any that were not chosen will just go to the back to the deck to be shuffled in for later. All right, so we are back upon the Phantom Epoch. The mission is over. We came back here to recover. Now there's a few things that we could do in between each of our missions. The first thing is we got a SP point for completing that tutorial mission. What the AP can be spent for is to get new cards for your character. Now, the top right hand corner is how much SP it costs to buy that card. So you could choose to buy this one right off the bat because you already have one so you could buy that one. Or you could choose to save that SP so after later missions you could buy these more expensive cards. Now, once you buy a card, that card is yours forever. You cannot sell it back. It is yours. And that means you would have 11 in your deck and you can still only take 10 on each mission. So you would have, if you want to take this new card with you, then you will have to trade out one card. However, once again, you still have that deck of 11 in between each mission. So each mission you could trade out and switch out cards however you would like. Now, the next thing you could do, you could actually change your character. If you were the human warrior, and the next time you want to be the Grolic Ranger, you could do that. This is the time you could change up your character. And that's why each character has their own sheet marking which ones they have completed. So you could kind of keep each character um, built how you would like, like them to be built. Now at this time you may also replay any mission if you want and you can start to leverage fame here. Each planet has some fame and you're going to get fame through some missions and expeditions. You, you could get some, you might lose some depending on your fame depends on, on the tier of equipment that you could buy from that planet. All right, now that we're on to the other mission, we're gonna actually encounter hazards for the first time. So a hazardous terrain is anything with a red border around here. In this mission, we have fire hazard. 
which when you enter into it, you will take three damage and you will obtain burning. Now burning is usually removed after taking the damage at the beginning of the next turn. Um, however, if you are still burning, if you start your turn in here, that burning is usually removed. However, if you're still in there, you that burning is going to stay, right? Because you're in there, but you won't take that damage again. You will just keep getting the burning condition until you don't start your turn in there. The second type of haz hazardous terrain is poison. Now, poison, when you step into it, you'll take three damage once again, and you'll be inflicted with weakened. Once again, same thing if you... Weakened is usually taken away when resting, but if you're still on here while you rest, then that weakened will not go away. You will still get that condition, but once again, you will not take that extra damage. You will only take the damage when entering upon it. Now for the th third and last type of hazardous terrain is a trap. Once again, that red border, a trap, you take five damage when entering that terrain. Now there's a stipulation here is if the trap token was placed on the map by something else, then once it's triggered, it will go away. However, if the trap token is on the map, then like if it's part of the map, then every time you walk into it, it will trigger again and again and again and it will never leave. Now for the setup part that we did not talk about last time are these event decks. So we have a deck of one through five and we have a deck of six plus. So what you're going to do is you're going to take that one through five deck. You'll give it a nice little shuffle here and you will draw five, one, two, three, four, five, not look at them and place them off to the side. The rest of them, you will put them back in the box and they will not be used during this mission. Then you will take that six plus deck, give it a good shuffle. And then you'll place the one through five cards on top there. And now we have our event deck for the mission. The next thing that's new during this mission, I really zoomed up here so you could see, cause it's kind of hard to see, are these black dotted lines here. These black dotted lines are gonna be around lava and later on you'll see in other missions water as well. Now what these are, these are terrains that you cannot walk through or you cannot move through, but you can leap through. You can draw a line of sight, but they're just a terrain that you cannot enter whatsoever. They're not hazardous. There's just, you cannot enter that terrain in any way. The next thing I wanted to point out here was what I had talked about last time was the campaign orbs. As you can see, it has a number one place right there, meaning because it has that number that means we know it is a campaign orb. So with that campaign orb, it said number one, we would come to this book, we'd open up to number one and we would read its thing and resolve it. And then after the, after doing that, you would flip that over, I mean it's inactive. And that means you will never be able to reactivate that orb, no matter how many times you play this scenario. Once you do that once, it is done for that campaign. Now, just like activating orbs and picking up Nova cells, to retrieve that treasure, you will need to end your turn adjacent to or on top of that treasure to pick it up. Once again, treasure, just like the orbs, also have that campaign versus mission treasure. There is no number, therefore this is a mission treasure where that orb that we talked about earlier was the campaign one. So this is just a mission, treasure that will pick up and do with whatever the mission says with that treasure. And we have mission complete again. We're back on the Phantom Epoch. Now, in between each mission, you can perform some expeditions. Now there's two type of expeditions here. And right now we're just gonna go over the story expeditions. There's story expeditions and then there's planet expeditions. Meaning for whatever planet you were just on, you could do an expedition on that planet. However, this one had its unlocked story expedition one here. Ooh, let's get that in focus. Now, a couple things that I want to talk about here. Story expeditions will only be played when told to, like this one. We've unlocked it, so that means we could go on this expedition. Otherwise, story expeditions cannot be chosen. And there's two different ways we could do
do these, this token here shows multiple people, means that whatever decision we make here are is decided as a team. Now, if there is a single person there, that means each individual person gets to choose what they whatever they want on these cards. Now, I'm trying not to show too much here, but you will have a story, you will be given choices, and then you'll go to the other side, and you'll be able to choose, read from A and B, whichever one you chose from earlier. And you get to resolve that. In between each one, you will get to go on one. So story expedition number one was unlocked in this one. So you could go on that story expedition one. And later missions, you can go on different ones. Another thing you could do while you're upon the Phantom Epoch is you can change your items, attachments, and equipment. So if you have multiple equipment and items and attachments, this is when you could switch them out, change them out, do whatever you want with them. Um, you could recharge them, put Nova Cells on them, you could take them Nova Cells off, switch around, you could do whatever you want with your board in between missions. Also, you may switch between characters. So if your buddy picked up something that you want, right, you could trade anything you want on your boards in between these missions. Another thing you could do is dismantle your attachments. So if you've got some attachment here that you either don't use anymore or you've found one that's better, you can dismantle it, which means you put it back into the attachment pile and you gain a Nova Cell for each tier. So if it was a tier one attachment, you will gain one Nova Cell for dismantling it. If it's a tier two attachment, you will gain two Nova Cells for dismantling it. And one of the last things you could do is you can go to the shop. Now, the shop is going to depend on what world you were just on or what planet you were just on. So we were just on Burkov. So we would go through these tiers and we would look to see which one we want, if we wanted any, and then we would buy them with our Nova cells. Just to go through one real quick so I could describe how it looks. So the top left hand corner is gonna say where it goes, right? So this is obviously on the head, so it's gonna go in the head helmet selection there. Then it, we're gonna have how much it costs to buy. So it costs two Nova cells to buy this from the shop. We've got the name up top. We've got, this is where we place the charges and it's got a one, it means we could only have one charge on it at a time. Meaning we charge it up, put one on there, we spend it, we have to spend another charge to do this effect again. Now there's two types. There's blue, that is auto, and there's red, which is manual. Blue is auto, meaning as soon as this is completed, this will happen. You don't really get a choice. It's not you do it whenever you want. It's whenever this happens, this is going to happen as long as you have the Nova Cell to spend um, for it to happen. If there was a manual one, the red one, then you choose when you want to use it and spend it. However, this one's auto, so that means you have to wait for whenever this to happen for it to do it, and you don't get to choose to do it or not. It just automatically happens. All right, so now you are spawning a boss. You're going to spawn that boss where it tells you to spawn it, and a few things about the boss. So they are going to behave very similar to any other adversary in the way in the way that they target, in the way that they attack, in the way that they do their initiative action. However, instead of having the individual cards, they have a board. Now I don't want to show too much here, but according to the amount of players their uh, stats are going to be a little different. They will have an inherent ability. I mean, they will do this ability every single turn with a certain initiative. And then they will have other attacks or other options, one through three, that they will do. Instead of a class or species, they have a boss deck that basically just says action one, two, or three. And that is how you will calculate their initiative is their inherent plus their one of the three that they will do. And that is how a boss is 
it spawned and played with. Now, as soon as that boss dies, he will drop Nova Cells equal to the mission difficulty plus the number of characters. So if this difficulty was one, we had two characters, so he would drop three Nova Cells as soon as he was defeated. And now for the last thing here is the expeditions for each planet. So each planet is gonna have their own expedition deck. So this, we were in Burkov, so we'll go to a Burkov expedition. You will randomly draw one of the expeditions from that planet and you, you'll do the same just as the story ones, but this one is more random. You still get to choose A or B You'll flip it over, you will resolve A or B, and you get to do one of these after every mission. And one other thing that you're gonna do in the Phantom Epoch is here's your actual Phantom Epoch board. As you can see, everything looks pretty run down and gray and out. And this is where you're gonna start gaining things throughout the mission and throughout the expeditions you're going to gain this vanish technology to unlock that you're going to gain laboratory schematics to unlock that you will gain a cybernetic equipment so you can start actually updating your phantom epoch here and as you do so once you obtain all those items you'll open it up as you can see it's all colorful upgrading it and you'll be able to add more things onto your campaign so that is the Phantom Epoch upgrade system there. You're actually upgrading your own ship there. That there is the how to play Phantom Epoch. I hope you're enjoying it well. I hope the tutorial worked good for you. If you have questions, go to the rule book. Go to the little sections there. Read through it. I hope this worked good for you. And have fun playing the Phantom Epoch.